Thursday here on the BWI Daily Edition, we are one step closer to the whiteout game. Penn State welcomes Auburn to Beaver Stadium for a big game. Biggest game of the season since the last game of the season. It's a big season for Penn State football, and we're going to break it down every day, Monday through Friday, on the BWI Daily Edition. We are post-practice on Wednesday, so I'm talking with Nate Bauer, senior editor of Blue White Illustrated, to get his thoughts on what we've seen so far and what we've heard so far from Penn State football. So, Nate... First off, welcome. And what have we seen and heard so far? What have your impressions been so far this week? Um, yeah, I th- I think that this is a team that with the experience that it had at Wisconsin and then the experience that it had against Ball State feels prepared, right? Like that's just, that's the general yeah. sense that I, w- that I would say is, uh, you know, it's kind of this contrast between Penn State, who has played a look like let's not put Ball State on the level. They're not. But yeah, they should be. A, that should be a pretty good team in the MAC, Right. And then Wisconsin, who very well might win the West in the Big Ten. And so Penn State's played two of those games and has the experience that goes with that and the confidence that goes with that against an Auburn team who played Akron, who was terrible. Yes. Just, just, just awful. And and can I say terrible in every facet of football, not just the talent wasn't good. I don't feel like it was a good game plan where that talent was put in a poor situation. So from beginning to end, that game was not good. Yeah. And so, and so, and there's that. And then there's also, they played at Alabama state and, and, you know, kind of, if you, actually go back and look didn't play all that well in the first half they yeah. kind of exploded in the second half in the third quarter yep. but it's it, none of which is to suggest that auburn is not a good team or does not represent maybe the toughest team uh maybe even tougher than than wisconsin it's that you just don't know you just there's yeah. there's nothing to compare it to and so and so yeah it's fine that auburn posted you know what was it 62 to 10 and 60 to nothing um or 60 to it it doesn't matter the point is Auburn scored a boatload of points and you still are not quite sure what that's going to look like against the defense of Penn State's quality and the same can be said of Auburn's defense where you know uh, not really challenged not not really and so the the, just uh, the gauge is difficult to uh to come up with for this game Nate and I were both at practice last night. Uh, He had his observations and, of course, his notes about what James Franklin had to say afterwards. If you want to get those observations about what happened at practice last night, bwi.rivals.com backslash subscribe. That's how you get all that insider information. Uh, Is there anything you can share with us about yesterday that you want to go over that we could talk about and uh, your observations from James after practice? We'll get into the big topic in just a little bit, but anything that stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously obviously the we'll get to the big topic. Um, It just it's I, I think it's tough timing for him, you know, and so that's that's what makes it interesting is. Yeah, they, he did also talk about Auburn a, a little bit. One of the things that stood out to me, and this is just because I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by his stance on non-conference scheduling. Yeah, when he was asked about when he was asked about how this Auburn game came to be, uh, I, I don't want to mess up the quote, so I, I won't. But to paraphrase, he said, uh, "Our administration wanted to play Auburn." That is absolutely 100% how he said it. Yeah, that's that's Period. the exact quote. Yep. And so and I laughed so, at that. <laughs> you know, look like he, he's he there's there's always a tact to this and uh, oh, uh, he's he's gentle about it. He's uh, he's rarely, you know, uh, outspoken to the level where it raises eyebrows. But yeah, he just he doesn't want to play this game like the. Like now that they're in it and they're in this situation, sure, you're gonna play it, you're gonna embrace it. That's what he said. Yeah, uh, they've embraced it. They, he's had a really good week of practice, spirited, all all of that stuff. All all of those things are fine. But from the larger perspective, if if it hadn't been clear on Tuesday when he said 
and advocated for neutral site games yeah where where, he, where it's a one off right like he wants nothing to do with the traditional Penn State model which we have seen for decades of marquee home and homes doesn't want anything to do with it <laughs> doesn't yeah. want to go doesn't like cuz cuz that's the thing is yeah you get Auburn this year here but then you have to go to Auburn next year and yeah. and so for 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 the schedule to play out as at Wisconsin, Mac contender Ball State, Auburn three weeks in a row to start the season. Like this, we're not talking about October November. These are the first three weeks of the season. Uh, you, you know that that is way more. That's than gr- that's gray hair if you had any. Like, to see. <laughs> That's that's gray hair if James had any hair left. That's what that is, what you're describing. Yeah. Um, and and, and exactly. he also brought up the point of it was scheduled when strength of schedule mattered to the college football playoff. But the way yeah. scheduling works is that, sure, you say in 2016, I want to play Auburn in 2021, which is like saying I want to go to the moon it, it just like it, so many things are going to happen between then and now that is the moon going to be cool to go to in 25, 30 years? Have we moved on from the moon? That was a terrible analogy. Penn State. No, I loved it. I loved it because here's the it, it, there's something else involved here. It's it's also like learning in 2016 that the moon isn't that great to begin with. Okay. Yeah. Penn State didn't like. This isn't a, a debatable topic. Penn State didn't go to the playoff in 2016 because it lost to Pitt. Yeah. Right? Like, that's it. If that Pitt game had not happened and Penn State goes 11-1, and one, they or 12-1 and one with the Big Ten Championship, they're into the playoff. That that Pitt game, and even if they, they had won that Pitt game, what I'm saying is you didn't need to if, – if they had won the Pitt game – uh, and lost a second game, right? Like lost to Michigan and Ohio State. The pick game would not have been so good, so impressive, right? To have put them over the top, right? Like, and that's and that's the whole point is it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it honestly does not matter who you play in the yeah. non-conference because it's... if you can get through nine games in the Big Ten and win all of them or all but one, you're going to go to the playoff. Yeah, and I, I've, said, I've said for years now, you have two options to get to the playoff. Lose once or be Alabama. Those are your two options. So pick one, and that's where Penn State has found themselves with this game. Uh, but the next thing that we have to talk about, because if we don't, then we're, you know, journalistically, we don't have integrity. Although, I got to say, this is so far from my realm of expertise of I'm very much just on the field stuff. But James Franklin, USC, those rumors, here's my problem with all the coaching rumors is, are they true? Are they not true? I've been asked this week, and I I don't have personal inside confirmation with anyone about those sort of things. So what are the decisions that, what, what are the factors that are the most important to James Franklin? All I can say personally is what he said publicly. And you mentioned he never comes out and is like really bombastic about anything. The closest he ever got was you can't lose ground in any facet anywhere to these guys, meaning Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia, Alabama. He was speaking directly about the facilities. Now, the facilities, as we saw yesterday at practice, they are being built. So to me, it's always going to be with James and, and, and from what I've gotten of him, do you have a chance to win. Can you yeah. win here? And if you can't, if you can't overcome the airport isn't the size or it's the destination a little harder to get to than Southern California, can you overcome those things? Is the university willing to meet you halfway or go a little bit beyond to keep James Franklin here? Am I off on that? And and what do you what is your read on this situation? Yeah, I, I think I think that the way that you just phrased it of meeting halfway is is the problem right like the the problem isn't it's not it's not his personal salary it's not uh like assistant salaries all of those things have climbed 
Uh, they have made investment in facilities. I don't know that it's at the pace that, right? Like, I mean, if yeah. you're taking context clues, I'm not sure that it's at the pace that, that they would prefer. Um, but it's businesses and, and look, like that's what we're talking about here is a business and bosses and climate. And yeah. so the question is, what is the climate of Penn State football in the broader university context? Where does football fit? How is it prioritized? Where does it fall within the athletic department? Those are real questions. And I think to Penn State fans in general, there is maybe, a, you know, a a lack of awareness, I guess, you, you, because you just you just think, oh, it's this juggernaut football program. It, that's what it is. It gets all the attention. It does everything that needs to, right? Yeah. For it to, for it to be very successful. Yeah. But, but that's not necessarily the case. <laughs> that's not yeah. right. And I'm in the, not, I'm to not your point of in the in the broader sense of the university. I think it's clear that in the in the football or in the athletic department proper, Penn State football dictates what goes on in the athletic department to a large degree. It's the university around that, which is, by the way, a billion-dollar organization as opposed to a multi-million-dollar organization. I know that that is like a distinction of who cares, but it does matter in the larger sense of these two uh, conflicting situations. Yeah, I... I, I guess that I would just push back somewhat and we never push back on each other, but football doesn't dictate what happens in athletics. And that's partly the problem. That is partly the issue is T Frank, they, they have 31 sports at Penn state and in a self-sustaining model where it's all it's all funded really through football TV contracts right. Uh, right. And, and men's and men's basketball. Uh, the, the fact that, and, and I'm not here to take a position as to whether or not they need to cut sports. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. But what I, what I would just point out is there is a broad investment in the whole. Okay. Right? So that's a fair so, point. And what happens is, I mean, basketball, men's basketball is the one that I see as getting more maybe short end of the stick in terms of the investment that's made into basketball. Now, that's changed. Sure. That's that's evolved a little bit with the hiring of, of Micah Shrewsbury. But for football, it's, the, the, it's a question of mentality in the sense of, all right, are you going to invest in your biggest – money maker right like are, are you going to do to pull out all the stops to to take most of the money or a, a large sum of the money that you make off of football and put it back into football or are you going to take that large sum of money that football makes and spread it out right make sure make sure that everything else is fl afloat and functioning right uh, and and operating at a high level and it's, it's just a fundamental question that athletic departments have to answer. And some athletic departments have made that decision and have made it very, very clear that, yes, you're, you want, uh, you know, uh, uh, volleyball, field hockey, right. What, you know, track and soccer, field, all, you want all of those programs. Yeah, yeah. You want, you want them to succeed but not at the expense of making the progress that needs to be made to compete on a national stage. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And so, and so I think, I think that creates, um, I, and I don't want to overblow the issue. I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like this is a, a huge, uh, gap or a huge problem that there is, but I, I do think it's something where Penn state, in the mind of maybe James Franklin, maybe the program itself, it, there are questions as to how committed are you? How, how all in is the athletic department and the university on building a football program that 
doesn't just get to the Big Ten title game once every five or ten years. Right. Like they want to win. They want to. They want to win the Big Ten. Yeah. Two out of every four years. They want to. Yeah. They want to get to the college football playoff. And and for it to take these event right, like all of the all of the uh, the contract renegotiations, all of those things that we have seen uh, happen for, for Penn State football in terms of facilities investment, all, all of all of those initiatives tend to happen in the aftermath of a story like this. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's been, it, and, and that was one of the things I've said is, you know, if you want to, if you do genuinely want to push forward you have to have some sort of negotiating power. You have to have some sort of leverage. And this has been it so far. Um, this is my last question on this topic. And this is the one where I think I sense an insecurity from Penn State football fans. And this is where I just, I think it's, it's painfully obvious. Is USC a better situation to win in the level you're talking about than what James Franklin has already built at Penn State. Because to me, if you're saying, I've yes. got to go now rebuild, that to me, uh, that's less appealing than what you have here. But as you just pointed out, all the possibilities of investments and all of those things, is USC a better place to win than Penn State? Yes, it is. Okay. Because I don't and, think it's, I, if it is, I don't think it's that big of a gulf in terms of... So what they've been able to do uh in in terms of what they've been able to do that's correct uh in terms of the perception of that program on the broader scale nationally it it is a the athletic just i'm i'm taking directly from the athletic the athletic ran a piece yesterday and i'm going to write about it today uh where they pulled a hundred i, I don't want to mess this up but it was like a hundred coaches, ADs, athletic administrators, that kind of stuff anonymously mm -hmm. to find what the top 10 jobs were in college football. What are the top 10 head coaching jobs? Southern Cal was six. Penn State, guess what Penn State was? 15? 16. 16, okay. So, okay. okay. But that I think that is a fair point to make that there are, like, if there are more... I would say that there are, because of the job James Franklin has done, there are maybe seven better situations than Penn State. And this is one of my biggest problems is people would say Texas is a better job. Yeah, yeah. That is, yeah. like, like that, I, I, I want to swear right now, but it's it's just absolutely patently false because they've gotten good coaches. They've, they've mismanaged. If you talk about, you know, the structure and the environment, Texas and the meddling and mismanagement of that organization is a reason yeah. I don't think it's a viable program. USC has this perception of being this great place. And since, what, the early to mid-2000s, it has been absolutely not that. And it doesn't matter how yeah. good the recruiting classes are, how good the recruiting base is, and I know that can largely come down to um, the, 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 the coaching staff. You can blame all of that on the coaching staff, but it's a systemic problem. It is not a simple Ooh. fix of you insert James Franklin and it's just better. There are problems at USC when it comes to yeah. viability of the marketplace that they're not the number one thing in town, uh, that totally. they have, uh, you know, atrophied. They are the fourth best team. Now, the, the one thing I'll say is it's easier to make up ground on, on Oregon than it is to make up ground on Ohio State. That, to me, is the biggest argument you have, that USC is a place you can get to a college football playoff. Who are the juggernauts in the Pac-12? Oregon. Uh, Washington was for a little bit, but that's kind of a Michigan State thing. And then I have to mention Utah because I'm maritally obligated to mention Utah. But we're not we're not going to actually call Oregon a juggernaut. At least I'm not. Right? Like in terms of in terms of a traditional sustained success. Right. I, I wouldn't go to that level uh, for Oregon. Ohio State is now and has been and they're in the same division like again is is that the reason for james franklin to leave no <laughs> like right like uh these things ebb and flow uh ohio state already lost to oregon this year so whether or not ohio state is even going to be 
as good as it's been in the past, in its recent past, this season is up for debate. But I just think that if you look at there's there's a dishonesty in suggesting that the path to success, if the investment is there, and these are the things that I don't know. What I don't know is what is okay. So maybe fans don't show up to games at Southern Cal, but what is the donor base? Right. And what does right. what does the donor base invest in the program? I know that Southern Cal recently rolled out new facilities. They have a new weight room. They have uh, a new football complex. You know, is that passion, is that that buy-in there on a consistent basis, not just now and not just in the past, but moving forward? Is it, it's got to be continual. That's, yeah. if there's a lesson in all of this, it's just as soon as you finish, right? So Penn State's working on this Lash project right now. When it's done, are you going to pack up all your equipment and go home and revisit the subject in 15 years? Right. Or is there another project to put shovels in the dirt? Right? Like, that's that's the question. And Penn State, when it built Lash, that was it. Haluba Hall, if you look at some of the new Don't get me places, started right? on like, that place. And so, well, no, and that's what I'm saying. It's like yeah. we go, we go in, we have fans don't see Haluba Hall. Like that's there's no reason for them to. The outdoor practice facility is beautiful. It's positioned on campus, and it, right, it's impressive. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the lash, the, the lash building is still uh, being worked on, but the locker room is beautiful. Uh, the, you know, some of the 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 weight, uh, not weight training, like the medical facilities that they've, they've built the training facilities that they've built inside lash, uh, the meeting position rooms, the auditorium, all of those things have been redone. The lobby, all those things have been re redone. But when you get upstairs in the lash building, and again, like this is a project that they are in progress on, but nothing's happening right now. Yeah. Like you and yeah. I, you and I were just upstairs at lash. Yeah. They had Does trophies sitting on coffee tables. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I had to laugh when it was like, oh, here's a nice uh, conversation piece. It's an orange bowl. <laughs> Liter not literally and also literally. You're, it, it's, just, it's just this delicate balance of obviously the program, it, it, is, in, it is imperative that it presents itself in the best light possible. Right. Right. And so when 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 that is what you have to do so that recruits are attracted to you, right? All, all of that stuff. When 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 that's what you have to do, you don't have the opportunity to come out and say, hey, and, and we haven't been there for years now because of COVID, but like there are few opportunities for the media or for anybody who really has uh, any context outside of the bubble of Penn State. Penn State's the only program I cover. I don't get to go see Georgia's new facility. Right. I don't get to go see uh, Northwestern's facility. But I've seen the social media, and I've and I've seen you know their their tours that they do on video. And let me tell you, it's not close. Yeah. It's not close. Yeah. And so you get upstairs in the last building, and you see the coaches' wing, and it looks like a day's in. Yeah. Yeah. Like. And they dress it up. There's pictures. They 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 do what they can to make it look good, but it's not on the level. And so, one, it's not on the level. That's its own problem. But two is what is the urgency to fix that? Right. Now. What what is the urgency? And if you don't have a sense of urgency every single day about how you're going to improve your program, then you've lost. Yeah. And that's it. That's the question. That's like, like we, we, oh, Southern Cal, a nice place to live. T Frank, when you're rich, everywhere is nice to live. That, so that's, that's uh, exactly yeah. right. That's what my, people point to the wrong things in this conversation as to what the, what the reasons are. 
And you yeah. know, you can always you can always go back and forth on all these things. But like, if you get a pay bump and you go to California and you are taxed at California rates, it doesn't matter. Like it, it and and like you said, once you reach a certain threshold of wealth, it it's fine. You know, it is what it, it is. What it is. Uh, I do want to move on because I want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, you I was can... going to say Montana. Montana is a great place to live when the chef lives with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kanye um, uh, and uh, um, uh, he tours with the Grateful Dead now. John Mayer live in Montana for a lot of the year. Of course, like anywhere. I always say this: like even in Ohio, there are nice places in Ohio. If you have enough money, you can find somewhere nice to live. Literally anywhere, and I. I'm teasing. You're, you're, I'm teasing Ohio a little bit, but it's just like when you go through. So <laughs> you want them to to come on the site and and scream at you, don't you? You're just well, inviting it. Now. I, I just you know I I uh, I've been through some of those parts of Ohio where you go yee, and I come from some of the parts of the Pennsylvania where you go yee, and it's it's they're similar. Let me tell you that. Uh, I do want to talk about the game this weekend. Something that came up in your recruiting uh, or your uh, your game day mailbag, and I called it recruiting mailbag because Ryan Snyder has one uh, that we talk about all the time, all the time on Fridays. So much mail coming up on all mail at Blue White Illustrated. I was I was teasing my tease coming up tomorrow. Ryan Snyder will talk a little bit about what's going on with recruiting and all that stuff. But your mailbag with Dave and Greg. Um, one of the one of the questions that was asked. I did. I've been thinking about this myself. Is Mike Yersich, I don't want, I never, I never believe coaches are holding anything back, but is there something that you think we haven't seen yet from this offense? And do you think there's a next step for what they want to do? Um, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I, 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 I agree with you in, in terms of holding things back. Uh, you got to win the game at Wisconsin. Yeah. So whatever it, whatever it took to beat Wisconsin, however, um, you know, with this, like, I, I think maybe there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the playbook. Yeah. Right? Like as a, as a concept and, and you know, this, uh, when we talk about the playbook as the media, it's like, okay, you, you have a certain amount of things that you have installed and these are the options that you have from game to game and that it's a static thing it's not it's not like that yes there are there are base sets and there are base things that they want to do and can do well but it it's constantly changing things being added things being pulled based on who the opponent is and what the opponent's tendencies are yeah and so and so to me, it's like, uh, all right, well, is there is there a fundamental element of Penn State's offense that they have purposefully kept hidden so that it would surprise Auburn? I think maybe a little bit, but not a lot, I, right? Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I just think, okay, um, you know. Uh, what what are what are how do Penn State's tight ends match up against their linebackers and safeties, right? Like as yeah. opposed to how the linebackers matched up against Ball State, right? Like was that was that a a matchup that could have been exploited against Ball State, but the game was already so well out of hand that they didn't need to, possibly. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. It's it's definitely uh, has more to do with what happened last week than what happened in the totality of the season. I think that's fair. Yes. Here's my question, and you brought up a, a part of the offense that has been pretty low key so far. My question is, does it matter? Does it matter? Because this is this is this is my point. There are certain parts of this offense that, depending on, doesn't matter scheme or or whether you're using certain plays or formations. They didn't produce in the Wisconsin game, and they didn't produce in the first half of the game against Ball State when we were actually watching football and not an extended practice for Penn State. Does it matter? Because this is a really good, really good from front to back, back to front, everywhere in the middle. There's a couple weak spots, but a really good Auburn defense. Does it matter? Or do you just have to beat the guy in front of you? Does the offensive line have to block and the tight ends have to get open, which they have not done those things consistently so far? Totally. Totally. It, 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 it is, yes, all of those matchups have to be won, uh, but again, 
we're, we're just going back to leverage and finding one-on-one matchups, right? And so Mike, for Mike Yurcich and for Sean Clifford, what is Auburn giving you? Right. Are they, are they taking away John Dotson? Are they, are they deciding John Dotson will absolutely not beat us? Well, if they do decide that, that's going to free up somebody else. That's going to, that's going to create an opportunity somewhere else. Maybe if, as you suggest, if the front of that Auburn defense is as difficult as Wisconsin's, maybe Noah Kane doesn't get going in the running game, in the, in the traditional running game, but maybe he does get going in the quick pass game there. Like it's just, it's just about, I, I don't, <clears throat> you have a better sense of this than I do right now, but I don't know what Auburn's going to do. I don't, I don't know what decisions Auburn is going to make in yeah. terms of its prioritization uh, so, of what it wants to take away from Penn State's offense. That's the thing is I don't think they have to prioritize. As of now, what I've seen on film, they can play four up front and they can win enough battles that they can do whatever they want. So that's, I guess, what, yeah. I'm, what I'm thinking is you can scheme up something to the outside, right? So wh- what I'm thinking is right now Penn State's running game has been in fits and starts. So do you scheme something on the edges of of the box or out in space i that's what i would do but at the same time that's an athletic defense and if they're sound and they don't have to cheat up on anything they're going to be able to play the field pretty balanced overall and that's where i'm wondering it it has it would have to be like a trick play or a thing that is going to surprise them and get you somebody to bust a coverage. That's really to me, because otherwise, schematically, I think that it's a pretty even matchup. And both, by the way, both sides of the ball have this problem. The the um they're they're big, but they're just guys on the Auburn offensive line. I think that they're good, uh, and you can see that good offensive lines can can do more than if you have one or two bad weak links on an offensive line. But there's no standout players on that Auburn offensive line that's going to generate these giant holes. So it's to me, it's about which in this situation is there is there a mistake? I, I hate to be the cliche, but who blinks first in this totally. game? Because both these teams are so similar right down to the style of the quarterback that you have under center. I don't think there's an advantage either way there. So, you know, that's I, I don't know if a trick play, and I hate to be so cliche because, you know, how I love the yeah. the matchups and fundamentals, but to me, I, I don't know that that is a, a huge tactical advantage. Uh Yeah, I, I mean, it, uh, the trick play thing is, is interesting to me just in the sense that, like, I think that sometimes in the past, y- you know, we have seen – an, a previously unseen wildcat, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Something, that was something along those lines, right? Uh, yeah. The 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 jet sweep, right? Yeah. Like something, right? Because I, I don't think Saquon Barkley taking I've the snap in the whiteout game versus Michigan in 2017, where they switched positions. We had never seen that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and and I mean, even even uh, what was it? A direct snap to KJ Hamler a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Like, I mean. There, so, uh, c- could that exist? Yeah, it probably does exist. Yeah. <laughs> it probably does exist. It's just, yeah. it's just a question of, is, is it the right time to use it? Is, yeah. is that, is that what they're expecting? Is that what they think that they need to get an edge, uh, you know, against Auburn? I mean, I, I just, I come back to the, the very same principle and you understand it on a, uh, a more complex basis than I do, but how much can you make? Sean Clifford uncomfortable. Yep. Yep. What does it, what, what does it take to do that? And, and like, you know, it's kind of the, the core of the game defensively is what resources does it demand to ruin the quarterback's day? Yep. <laughs> Whether that's sacking him, confusing him, creating pressure. Uh, I, I brought it up uh, yesterday and I, I, I'm actually kind of curious, maybe it's for another time, but you know, defensive ends dropping into pass coverage now. Yeah. Yep. Like that, like, like we saw it with Jesse Lucetta, but that's becoming more prevalent in general. I think it, it, I would be nervous for Penn State, if for Penn State fans, I would be nervous <coughs> if you see Nick Tarburton in the flat and tank Bigsby's coming his way, because that Nick, Nick has Tarburton been a almost thing. Had an interception. Nick Harburton almost had an interception at Wisconsin. He he almost had an interception at Wisconsin. He almost uh, laid out Justin Hall. 
I'm just saying Tank Bigsby and Jarquez Hunter are a different animal than those two. And you totally. like it is a risk reward thing. Jesse Lucchetta is a little bit better of a situation to drop in coverage than than Nick Tarburton is. And but but Brent Pry's been going this way for a couple years now. And I think that it's yeah. good. I think that this is a good thing, but that is one thing of like somebody's going to be in space and they're going to have to make a play. And to me, that's the game. For me, that's the game of do you make enough of those plays to contain the Auburn offense? Because they're going to try and do the same thing of getting their one player in space, one or two. You know, they're both running backs. I've been told, Jarquez Hunter, stop talking about just Tank Bigsby. Talk about the other guy, too, because they're both talented. You you get those guys, you corral them. There are no other skill players. And, and that's why I think it's such an even game. And that's my question for you, kind of in a broad sense. I think you just gave it to me. You have to frustrate the quarterback on both sides of the ball to win this game, right? Is that how you're seeing? Totally. From yeah. both sides. It's yep. right. Like, because you don't the the rap on Bo Nix is that he gets rattled and that in yep. certain situations, some big games that that Auburn's had, that's the frustration on Auburn fans uh perspective is that he hasn't had the performances on a consistent basis in these types of games uh, that you want to see. And sometimes can be an active detriment. Well, Penn State fans should know about that pretty well. Yeah. I think that yeah. I think that Sean Clifford has had some of those same struggles. It's not to say that he hasn't had success too. He has. But in in some of those moments, in some of those situations, they stand out to you. And so if 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 the opportunity exists to get to this guy, to get to Bo Nix and create that uncertainty, again, not just through a pass rush, but through confusing yeah. uh, back end coverages. Yeah, I mean that's I think that's I think that's your key to to preventing them from getting to to thirty, right? I mean, yeah. which I think is probably going to be enough to win this game. Yeah, and, and to me, that's that's the reason I I am giving Penn State the advantage going to this game is the crowd is going to be a major factor for Bo Nix on, on the offensive side of the ball with communication, and they have the secondary to do it. They have the secondary to frustrate a quarterback, and then it just comes down to Brandon Smith and Curtis Jacobs and Ellis Brooks not missing tackles. And I know it's pointing out just yeah. the linebackers. Everyone has to be gap sound on that front seven. Everyone has to do their job, but there's going to be three or four plays where – Things don't go right, and you've got to tackle that guy. And so far, Penn State has been good about doing that. They've been good about limiting those big explosive plays. And, you know, I'm going to ride with the ability to do that in this game, I think, and that's why I think Penn State does have the advantage. But, you know, it just takes one of those. It, as James Franklin says, the two most important things, turnovers and explosive plays. And this team, this game could have a lot of them or none of them because based on the way the personnel works. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm... I mean, I, I don't have a ton to add it just in the sense that Penn State demonstrated at Wisconsin that it could create those plays, yep. <clears throat> that it could that it could do that for itself offensively. Yep. And <clears throat> and that was in the absence. Right. They had they had th three plays, four play, four plays of 40 or more yards at Wisconsin. Yeah. And they left two or three on the table. And, and and they left two or three on the table. Yeah. So what does that what does that what does that mean for Auburn? Well, I don't know because I don't know what I don't know what Auburn's plan is going to be. Yeah. Um, but if Auburn's plan, you would assume, is going to be more in line with Wisconsin than Ball State, which chose to keep everything in front of it. It, I mean, it was giving up, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> here, here's 15 yards of play. Have it, but you're not going to get 20. You're not going to get 30. You're not going to get six points in 17 seconds. Yeah. And I don't, but I don't anticipate Auburn to think that way. Yeah. Uh, right. Like that's not, that's not the style that they're going to play. So in that sense, all right, John Dotson, Keandre Lambert Smith, Parker Washington, Theo Johnson, right. Brent yep. Strange. Yep. No, okay. Like whatever, like the, like, okay, this is, this is the opportunity. And then, Hey, but also, and more important, Sean, you got to get them the ball. Yeah, yep. <laughs> like you got to you got to get them the ball. It's got to be in the right spot. Uh, and when that opportunity comes, which as we have talked about, it it you don't get an unlimited amount of ten yard halos around an open receiver. Yep. Yeah, you, and you that get, you get a couple you get a couple of those, and you got to cash in when they're there. 
that that is a a huge factor so far this season and something we're going to talk about next it's an extended edition an xl edition because it's such a big weekend on the bwi daily edition coming up next mike renner of pff is going to be joining us talk more in depth about the game and what he sees from penn state so far this season and of course from auburn i'm your host thomas frank carr we'll be right back Welcome back to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm super excited to have on the show with me Mike Renner of PFF and of the Tailgate Podcast, who is going to be in State College this weekend because if, you're ta- if your podcast and your YouTube show is named Tailgate, you've got to go to some of the best tailgating destinations, at least within driving distance. Right, Mike? Yes. This one, this was one we had circled uh, big on the calendar when we were planning this all out. We are like the whiteout. We heard it's a once in a lifetime experience. We've got to go. Never been to Beaver Stadium, never been to Happy Valley. So I am elated. I, I'm looking forward to it. I've been looking forward to this one all week. The game day experience, is, you know, at the stadium, people have seen that on TV. What have you heard about the actual tailgating outside? And have you heard of the game Stump before? <laughs> oh, we literally just played Stump last weekend at Ohio State. I played a couple all times. Right. In my life is that is that big out there oh yeah yeah i mean it's among yeah. it's among a lot of the big tailgating games but yeah stump is uh this is very much an ohio state like area outside of state college so yeah stump is pretty big see we never played stump I, I went to notre dame tailgating scene there is pretty big stump was not a game that we played it was really uh cornhole and you know at if you're at a tailgate it's cornhole and beer pong or the games that you're used to seeing people play outside so what, what is it that makes a great tailgate? Is it the beverages? Is it the food? Is it the games? Is it the, what is it that makes a great tailgate experience for you? I guess the energy. It's just, you got to have a lot of people in a very close proximity. I think the schools that don't have great tailgate scenes, they're kind of the ones that have the disjointed parking lots where it's like one lot with like 50 cars. And it's like, that. that's not a tailgate. A tailgate is one massive lot where you can walk, you know, a half mile this way, a half mile that way, and see everyone partying left and right. I think that's what makes a perfect tailgate is kind of the energy because, uh, you know, everyone's going to have alcohol. Everyone's going to have food. That's that's not – that's sort of ubiquitous across the college football landscape, but it's the energy that you can't replicate. Yeah, and and to your point, Penn State is built around pastures, so there's like four of those of what you described around the oh, stadium. So it perfect. it is a it is a great place. The one thing I'll say is uh, there are thunderstorms in uh, the forecast for Saturday night. Hopefully that doesn't affect any of that stuff. Uh, we had one roll through last night that tore down some electrical stuff in the t- in the RV lot. So it's uh, it should still be an awesome experience, but that's always a bummer when you've got a roll that into the forecast uh keep the fingers crossed fingers crossed here we're hoping for good weather yeah absolutely because it's it's it, as you said it's an experience you don't want to have uh differentiated marred augmented in any way <laughs> i want to get into the game uh, and talk a little bit about some of the guys that are going to be a key part of this game from your perspective and mike for pff is their lead draft analyst so he focuses a lot on the prospects in the game uh, we'll get to Bo Nix in a little bit because he's been a prospect since he stepped foot on campus at Auburn. But on the Penn State side of the ball, a guy that I think is a unique guy in this game is Rasheed Walker. There were big expectations. James Franklin was talking him up this spring about a guy that the light had come on. And he's a, a very athletic player. But what have you seen so far from him through two games? It's not been good. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I was high on him coming into the season. The tools that he brings to the table, you know, I think... Offensive tackle prospects, you can kind of tell right away the guys that have quote unquote it, like the guys that are 330, 320, can move, are actually athletic. That's Rasheed Walker. Like he is a powerful, agile, big man. Good Lord only made so many of them, but that only gets you in the building. That, that only makes yeah. you a prospect. It's what you do, you know, in terms of advancing technically, advancing with your consistency that makes you a high end prospect worthy of a first round, second round type of selection. And man, you go watch that Wisconsin game and his struggles with inside moves. And I love, I love watching tackles against undersized edge rushers, the guys who are really just going to beat you with quicks because it kind of shows, kind of exposes the guys whose technique and whose footwork is bad. And that was Rasheed Walker in that game. I think his footwork still has a long way to go before he's you know considered among some of the ta- top tackle prospects in this class or even next class if he does return to school uh so that i had high hopes but disappointing out the gate but it's not 
two. I, I'm not going to write him off just yet. It was two games. I do think he has a very good test. There's a lot of great matchups in this game. And him going against Derek Hall of Auburn, who is a ascending prospect in his own right, has been a yeah. monster through two games, one of the most explosive edge rushes in the country. That's going to be a tough test that basically Penn State needs to pass on that left side. Yeah, and, and it's it's been an interesting thing. Did you see a difference between Rasheed Walker in the first half or the second half of that uh, Wisconsin game, or was it pretty consistent, the technical issues throughout? And it was just a function of, you know, sometimes you win some and sometimes you lose some in that game because they were able to move the ball yeah. in the second half through the air. Yeah, I don't, I'm not necessarily sure I one half versus the other. I, I think okay. he just really struggled with the athleticism of those guys. And not, not necessarily just athleticism. It's like, guys who are quicker and undersized edge rushers are going to always give college tackles fits unless you are those guys that can actually move. So talk to us then about Derek Hall, what he brings to the table and what Penn State is going to see because, you know, probably don't know a lot about that uh, Auburn front who has been very impressive so far through the first two games this year. Yeah, they really have. And now competition level, not great. Obviously, what I read a couple weeks ago that they just utterly manhandled up front. So that that's a factor. But... Derek Hall, to me, is a real deal prospect. He is going to test Rasheed Walker's, not only his anchor, but his ability to get off the line of scrimmage. This guy can fly. Derek Hall is about 250 pounds, an explosive guy. And through the first couple of weeks, he is a speed and speed to power type of guy. He is going to try to go through and push the pocket. And so if your anchor can't hold up, if you're not able to you know, reset and hold against a bull rusher like that, it's you're, he's going to collapse the pocket all night. So I think it's a great test for Sheed Walker, a great sort of makeup game for him and his draft stock if he performs well. And that leads me into a great transition of, I don't know if Sean Clifford is a prospect necessarily, but he is draft eligible uh, and, and pressure has been a problem from him throughout his career. I guess my question is, and this is for both quarterbacks in this game. From what I've seen, neither guy is great when they get to their second read, when they have to come off their first, go to their second read. From what you've seen of quarterbacks, how common is that at the college football level? Can guys typically go through their progressions, or is it you know only the rare exceptions of guys that are good at getting from one to two to three and then a check down? I don't think it's necessarily uncommon, but it's also like, it's kind of like arm strength where... Uh, you know, there are guys, some, some guys with weak arms who can get through progressions. There are some guys who have strong arms who can't get through progressions. There are some guys, uh, but there's very few with strong arms that can also get through progressions. So I think Clifford falls in the somewhat average arm and mm -hmm. also can't get through progressions, also can't get to like the <laughs> second. Nick says at least a cannon for an arm, at least it's like a little toolsy yeah. is why he's been, you know, the star since his true freshman year. But man, not only just getting through progressions, his accuracy is a nightmare, even on when his first reads there. Uh, so I think that's the biggest thing is these guys. Uh, now, obviously, Clifford, I don't think is much of a prospect. Nix has been thought of as one because of, like I said, he has some physical ability, but he's also been probably their biggest issue offensively the last two years and even this past week, probably. So I do think that that's a matchup that if you're looking at you know, Penn State's defense, all they have, you have to be thinking – that should be a win for us. Yeah, and that leads us into Jaquan Brisker, Tariq Castro-Fields, that secondary. I know PFF's very high on uh, Jaquan Brisker. What can they do in this game, and what do you want to see out of them to maybe help the Penn State defense bring out some of those old Bo Nix plays that he hasn't shown so far this season? Yeah, so I don't think you need to too much, to, truthfully, <laughs> to bring out that old Bo Nix. Like, I... I still don't trust him. I do think it's more going to be Jaquan Brisker has got to be your playmaker in the run game because they throw a lot at you in terms of what they do offensively in that run game. Yeah, I think he's got to be in it, and I have full faith in him being that. He is, my, for my money, the best sort of uh, best box safety top slash linebacker guy in this draft class. Now, Kyle Hamilton's probably the top safety in the draft class and a versatile dude, but Jaquan Brisker, just how he plays the run, is as good as it gets. He is one of the best tacklers. He is very physical. He can take on blocks. He can basically do all of that. And so I think he is going to be massive in terms of stopping that Auburn running game and basically saying, hey, Bo Nix, make Bo Nix beat you because that's a proposition I like for the Penn State defense. So that brings me to something I asked James Franklin yesterday when we were talking about this Auburn game. Can one guy in a team sport like football, outside the quarterback, 
can one guy take over a game? And how hard is that to do? And I had Tank Bigsby in mind, but that running game in general from Auburn, are those guys capable of doing that against somebody that you just mentioned that you think very highly of in Jaquan Brisker and a defensive front for Penn State so far that has shown against a reasonable Wisconsin offense that they could get penetration, they get in the backfield, and they can make plays? Can one guy take over a game that way? Defensively, it would have to be along the line of scrimmage. It's going to have to be a DT, D end, whether it was you know Chase Young all the way back to Dom Kinsu when he was you know at Nebraska, guys like that. Now, offensively, I would also say yes, but it would be a running back. Tank Bigsby could, very well could. He, he is, in my opinion, the best running back in the country. That guy yeah. is an absolute monster with the ball in his hands, whether it's speed, acceleration, cutting ability, tackle breaking ability. He is the total package at the position. He is going to be, that is who you are game planning for if you're Penn State right now. Because he's, like I said, the guy that, you have to worry about for that offense because uh, he is at, as good as he gets at the position in college football, like I said. So that uh, now is he going to take over the game? I doubt it. Like Penn State's still a very good defense. This offense line for Auburn isn't anything special. He's not going to have, you know, gobs of space to work with, but that doesn't necessarily mean like it's still going to take a team effort defensively for Penn State to shut him down. And the reason I, I brought that up is when I was talking to some Auburn people earlier this week, they were saying things that reminded me of what I was saying about Saquon Barkley a couple years ago. And not necessarily that they're physically the same player, but in that sense of forget the quarterback, forget everybody else. You got to focus on this guy. He can take yeah. over that game. And that's that's what I've been wondering this whole week because outside of Bigsby, is there anyone that you've been looking at in that offensive skill position group that are somebody you have your eye on, even if they aren't guys this year, but prospects down the line, high recruits? I haven't seen anything that stood out to me. Have you Have you seen anybody? No, tr truthfully, okay. in terms of their uh, older wide receivers uh, with Shedrick Jackson and Demetrius Robinson, like the, they're not really on the radar in terms of draftable or highly draft, drafted guys. So the young guys I haven't actually watched, but – those are, I think they're one and two. So I, I have not, I don't think they're playmakers or anything special that necessarily strike fear in me as a defense. It is, like I said, it's Tank Bigsby. I think if you shut down him, that Auburn offense goes with it. And that flips us to the other side of the field and a guy that, um, has your opinion of Jahan Dotson changed over time or do you think just opportunity has increased for him? I think it's more it's opportunity. I, I am a fan of his. I do think he's still kind of limited in that on the smaller end for the position and mm -hmm. probably not, you know, he's not KJ Hamler athletically. KJ Hamler's on the smaller end. KJ Hamler was a different dude and way brought to the table physically. John Dawson's just a solid athlete in, you know, with, with size concerns at the next level. So as a prospect, if he on him in terms of like probably a late day two, day three kind of wide receiver at this point, if anything, but the college game is different than the pro game. You, you know, yeah. like you worry about that at the pro game because every cornerback is six foot, 200 pounds. Every cornerback is going to have 15, 20 pounds in him. That's not the case in college. So he's going up against a guy who in another great matchup for watching this game is Roger McCreary, cornerback. I believe he's a senior for Auburn, if not a redshirt junior, who one of the top cornerbacks in the AC, SEC the past two seasons is not in and of himself a big dude. I think he's only around 190 pounds, 5'11". Um, so a matchup that Dotson, if you're you know going to buy into him as a prospect, he should be, he should win those one-on-one -on -one matchups. A guy like Roger McCreary, who is, you know, kind of plays the same game as Dotson in terms of not going to get super physical with you, going to more be a you know speed and mirror ability type of corner. So I do think that's one matchup that I keep, I'm going to be keeping my eye on all game. Mike Renner from the Tailgate Podcast, senior draft analyst for PFF and at PFF underscore Mike if you want to check out what he does on Twitter or the tailgate podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or on YouTube uh, has that contested catchability from Jahan Dotson last year he showed some some really highlight plays but was the most consistent player maybe outside of Pat Fryermuth in terms of ability to go get the ball in those matchups that he has mm -hmm. with McCreary um, is that something that you're 
the, is it the physicality? What is it about like contested catch players that is trans that transitions between players, even if they don't have the physicality or the size uh, to be what you would think of as that guy? Well, it's body control is kind of how I would lump all that into the, the catch all term for that is I call it body control. It's like, are you attacking the ball correctly, whether it's your guys right on you and you have to go over him or if there's no one on you and it's just on your back shoulder and you have to adjust to it. I think some receivers are very good at that and make that look natural and make it look like that was nothing. And that to me is Jahan Dotson. Uh, some receivers fight the ball and a ball that's just behind them will look like it's way behind them because they didn't adjust quick enough to it. Uh, and that's, you know, some guys that you worry about when projecting the next level. So I think with Dotson, he, he very much has that now. Again, size will still help out a lot in those situations. Uh, when you are giving up 20 to 30 pounds, it's difficult to you know go over the top of somebody. You can get boxed out down the football field. But like I said, I've seen enough from him, Dotson, to know that, uh, the dude's ball skills are pretty damn good. Is there anybody in this game that you're looking at that we haven't talked about that you're interested in and, and you want to mention? Yeah, I think Brandon Smith, too. The linebacker is going to be, you know, we, we mentioned that Brisker is going to be massive to stopping Tank Bigsby. Well, yep. Brandon Smith's going to be pretty massive to stopping Tank Bigsby, too, because he can keep up athletically. Uh, he, he's one of the most athletic linebackers for a you know 240-plus pound linebacker in the country. So his ability to bring down Tank Bigsby or just locate him in space is going to be basically kind of the story of the game. Like if he gets exposed, uh, if he looks like you know he's left out hanging a few times there, going one on with Bigsby, that's that's going to be tape that you go back to as an evaluator and say, Ugh, that that's not great for a guy that is going to be facing running backs like that every single week next year. So uh, I, I do think this would be big for his eval and big for basically Penn State's defense. Yeah, it moved from the Sam to the Will this year. People were expecting a breakout season. Little up and down in the Wisconsin game. Uh, I don't think, you know, PFF gave him a, a below average run uh, run defense grade. His tackling has gotten better, uh, but again, Ball State. So he's been a fascinating read for me to just watch throughout this season. Are you expecting him to be up to that challenge? What have you seen, I guess, what you, from the, from the non-physical side so far, what have you seen from him like and dislike? I'll be honest. I mean, I don't think anyone's up to the challenge of Tank Bigsby. I'll, I'll just say that one-on-one <laughs> okay. -on -one in space, he, he's going to be tough. It's going to be – that's why I said it's going to be a team effort. It's more you, – you're going to have to have multiple guys rallying to the ball every single time because he is that special breed that, uh, you know, at this level, the guys that are the difference makers at running back, they win usually more often than not against linebackers and whatnot. So uh, I, I do think that – if Smith does obviously play well and, and does, you know, wrap up his space and is making plays in the ball carrier, massive for Penn State's defense, but I don't really foresee any one player being able to consistently do that in this game. Right, right. Um, anything uh, from coming up that you want to talk about uh, that you guys are doing over at PFF? Uh, well, I guess just if you're uh, – any, any good tailgate recommendations, anywhere to go – please reach out to us. We're looking for things to do. Any restaurant bar recommendations to go while we're up there? Uh, we are all ears because uh, I'm, I'm super excited and I've heard amazing things. I want to have want to have the best weekend all year. We're, we're, we're grading every tailgate we go to. So <laughs> high mark. High mark right now is Ohio State and you can't lose to Ohio State, Penn State. So bring out, bring the energy and we'll, uh, we'll see what grade we get at the end of the week. Uh, they Penn State fans typically rise to the challenge in that situation. You've been called out now, Penn State fans. Uh, give them a couple. I'll give you a couple off air because none of them are sponsoring the, the, the podcast, and I'm not giving away free rent here. But uh, there are a couple I'll get you off air. Mike Renner of the Tailgate Podcast on the BWI Daily Edition. Thanks for so much for giving us your time today. No, for sure, Tom. Thanks, man. We'll be back tomorrow on the BWI Daily Edition. As always, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube.